Uh, good morning everybody from Melbourne, Australia and thank you very much for, for taking the time out of your day to join in and have a listen to this research that's been a big part of my life as Andrew said for the past 16 years. So I thought to begin with it'd be useful to, to let you all know how this all started, um, how this whole project first came about. And it was on a hot August day in 2005 and I was actually meeting with an amazing woman by the name of Marion Fontana and we were meeting in a little cafe right across the road from her firefighter husband Dave's firehouse in Park Slope in Brooklyn. And Marion and Dave should have been celebrating their eighth wedding anniversary on the afternoon of September 11th, 2001, the day of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. And Dave had just completed a 24 hour shift at his Brooklyn firehouse with squad one when Marion phoned him that morning to confirm their plans for the day. Aidan, their young son who you can see pictured here in this photo, was just five years old at the time and it was his first day of primary school on that morning. So they were dropping him off at school and Marion and Dave had been really looking forward to spending the whole day together just luxuriating and having child free time together and they were going to be visiting museums and just enjoying spending the morning together. Um, but he, but Marion knew that Dave, being the kind of great guy that he was and the person that lived the closest to the local firehouse, he always let all of his colleagues go home first. He was always the last person to leave. So she wanted to make sure that he was actually done and that he was on his way home. He was done, he told her on the phone, and they organised to meet at a local cafe. And that was it, she told me. No profound discussions. She can't even remember if she told him she loved him. We always did, she told me, but ingrained habits are forgotten sometimes. And I just can't remember if we said it that morning. And a little while later, as she waited at the cafe, Marion noticed people talking animatedly around her, some staring up at the sky. And she said she heard people talking about airplanes and the Twin Towers. And as a friend approached her at the cafe, she said to her, Marion, a plane just crashed into the world, into the Twin Towers. And as Marion looked up, she saw a thick black cloud of smoke stretching across the perfectly blue sky from downtown Manhattan. She knew it was a big job and she knew Dave would have gone. She got home in time just in uh, to turn on the television and witness the devastation. Both towers of the World Trade Center were on fire. She remembers watching as a man in a green shirt tucked his knees up like a kid doing a cannonball into a pool and jumped from one of the towers. What's happening, she asked the television, bewildered. And then she heard it, a low guttural rumbling sound coming from her television. The South Tower fell. She knew, she said, in an instant, that Dave was dead. She tells me there was an instant disconnect in her heart. She couldn't avert her eyes from the television, searching the ash-covered faces of those trying to flee the carnage looking for the familiar features of Dave, even though she knew deep down he was gone. She says the waiting for news was torturous, grabbing the phone each time it rang, desperately hoping that it was Dave calling to say he was okay. Friends and neighbours called, some arrived with food throughout the day, and although she hadn't smoked in 13 years, she lit a cigarette. Around lunchtime, crying and pacing around the small apartment that she shared with Dave, Marion and her friends started to call the emergency departments of the hospitals surrounding the World Trade Center. There were busy signals, confused nurses. They desperately checked their lists for Dave's name, but they couldn't find it. Doctors and nurses in the hospitals near the towers were waiting, but as we now know, the emergency rooms were virtually empty. Around 11.30 that night, firefighter Tony Edwards and Lieutenant Dennis Farrell from Squad One arrived looking incredibly tired, but yet very official. Marion tells me how she's imagined this day, ever since Dave started working as a firefighter. She pictured herself looking perplexed as to why the fire company had arrived. A captain stepping forward and it suddenly dawns on her why they're there. She cries out, collapsing in the hallway, her chest hurting, her stomach dropping. But none of it comes even close, she tells me to the sonic blast she feels when it actually happens to her in real life. We didn't find any of the guys from squad, Tony tells Marion. The whole company was missing. David Fontana, a member of Park Slope's elite squad one, 
died with his team as they climbed the stairs of the South Tower to rescue thousands of trapped civilians. Squad One lost half of its men at the World Trade Centre that day. 12 brave brothers among 413 first responders that died that day, desperately trying to help others. And on that day, back in 2005, as I sat across from Marion, I asked her how she was coping, especially that the fourth anniversary was looming at the time that I met her. And she seemed surprisingly resilient, although I'm sure there were moments of pure, raw grief that were dealt with in private. But on that day, instead of talking about her own devastation, she was more worried about the plight of the surviving responders. She tells me that she often thinks about how Dave would have coped with 9-11 if he had have survived. How traumatised he would have been by what he witnessed at Ground Zero, by losing so many of his friends and colleagues. She wonders if their marriage would have survived 9-11. So there's nothing you can do for me, she told me, sipping on her coffee that day, but it's the guys that have been left behind. They're haunted by what they saw, what they had to do, how many colleagues and friends were lost. They're the ones that we need to be worried about. And as it turns out, she was right. Now, 16 years after 9-11, the impact on the surviving responders is ongoing, traumatised by 9-11 because what they experienced hasn't ended. New cases of 9-11 related illness are diagnosed regularly among the responding survivors. Cancer rates are around 15% higher in those who were exposed to ground zero compared to those who were not. And sadly, in the years following 9-11, more than 1,000 responders have now died from illnesses and cancers directly related to their exposure to ground zero. Over 7,000 more are currently being treated for 9-11 related illnesses and are on the World Trade Center Health Registry. And around a thousand of these are currently being treated for 9-11 related cancers. The reality is that the death toll from the terrorist attack grows larger each year. And while the physical wounds may have healed, the emotional scars remain for many responders, even now, 16 years on. And in many cases, the ongoing impact of 9-11 has shattered families and destroyed lives in a never ending reverberation of pain and suffering. The stories of these responders and their families need to be told. Their voices need to be heard. So this research is for Marion and for Dave. And it's for Aidan, who grew up without his dad. And it's for all of the 9-11 responders, both fallen and surviving, and their ever-dedicated support networks, families and friends. I hope that it in some small way captures their collective voices and allows the rest of the world to understand what they continue to live with. This photo shows John Field leaning against a wall in the Responders Remembered Park. It's around an hour outside of New York City and I was incredibly fortunate enough to be uh, able to visit the park last time I was in New York last year. And you might notice there's names engraved on the wall here. Each year, as a tribute to all of the responders who continue to die from their heroic actions on the day of 9-11 and in the eight months in the following uh, cleanup and recovery, John Field etches their names onto the responders' remembered wall so that all of the re all responders, the 413 who died on the day, plus the thousand um, or so more that have died since, continue to be remembered and recognised. The September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks are probably familiar to all of us and we probably have our own recollections of where we were and what we were doing. And they were the largest concentrated emergency service response in United States history. At least 100 ambulances from around 31 EMS services raced to the scene, setting up triage centres and beginning to treat and transport people. More than 2,000 New York Police Department or NYPD and Port Authority Police Department, or PAPD, police officers secured the scene and began to evacuate survivors. But the response was, first and foremost, a fire department of New York, or FDNY, operation, including 214 FDNY units. Of the 214 FDNY units that were dispatched, only 117 of them activated their 1084 status, signalling that they had arrived. The details of what many emergency response units did at the scene remain hazy even today. 
and some will never be known. We won't know who was there or what they were doing and where they were when the towers fell. The primary EMS or emergency medical service provider for New York is the FDNY EMS division. And in addition to the um, FDNY EMS, there are approximately 30 hospital-based EMS services contracted by the city to provide emergency medical service around New York. And these agencies deliver full-time, professional, basic life support and advanced life support services to New York City. In 2001, there were approximately 950 daily ambulance tours, responding to a city of almost 8 million residents and an immeasurable number of tourists. On 9-11, 24 EMS supervisors were involved in the response to the World Trade Centre, along with 29 advanced life support and 58 basic life support um, units. And so if we assume that each unit had a minimum two member crew on board, there were nearly 200 paramedics and emergency medical technicians at the scene. And by the time evening fell, an estimated 400 additional EMS personnel had made their way to ground zero. But this summary only partly conveys the true scale and complexity of the emergency response to 9-11. Off-duty firefighters, paramedics, EMTs and police officers, at times entire companies, self-dispatched to the site without orders. And when responders reflect on their experiences on 9-11 and at Ground Zero, or the pile as they refer to it, they most often talk about noises, about sights and about smells. The noise of generators, of machinery, people, as massive pieces of construction equipment moved among the ruins of the pile, picking up the debris, moving things around, looking for people. The noises and shouts of contractors, waving, pointing, directing people out of the oncoming danger that might be a huge skip loader bearing down or a crane lifting debris overhead. A noise of shovels against concrete as tired responders moved rubble, searching. There were no office decks, no computers, no evidence of what had previously filled these office towers. There was very little evidence of the thousands of people who had perished within these buildings. There was only rubble and dust, lots of dust. One of the male firefighters that I spoke to told me that people were frantic. They were running everywhere. A man came running up to me, screaming that a woman had come out of Tower One and her skin was dripping off. She'd been burned by the fireball that came rushing down the elevator shaft after the first plane went into the North Tower. And then there's the smell. Many of the responders that I've spoken to over the years often reflect on the smell of the pile. They say it was the smell of death. And one female paramedic tried to explain it to me. And she said, it's the smell of bodies, but not the smell of someone who's been dead for a long time, but the smell of someone that has just died. And the blood, I can still remember that smell. And the fires, there were fires all around us. So that's what I remember, the smell of death and smoke. The responders called it death dust. It was an odour that many responders had never experienced before, yet they all knew what it was as they approached the pile in the days to come. The face masks they wore helped to a degree, but it still seeped through. It got in their hair, in their clothes, under their fingernails. Some of them tried to use Vicks or Tiger Balm on their moustaches or smearing it under their noses to cut down the odour, but yet it still came. The odour dug deep down into their psyches. And many responders actually developed sinus infections. And one male urban search and rescue um, guy actually told me that he could hardly speak on that first day after he came home. His throats were so clear as he'd been constantly trying to clear it to get rid of that smell out of his airways. And in addition to the noises that they heard and the smells that they recollect, they often talk about as well this expression of 9-11, the look that so many responders, volunteers and family members of victims had. It was a mixture of sadness and love, hope and despair. And one male urban search and rescue guy actually said to me, you know, it was the look of the family members of the victims who held up signs to us each night as we were working and then leaving to go home from the pile. And he said, every night without fail, he saw the same young woman there. And every night without fail, she'd ask, 
have you seen my brother? He worked on the 92nd floor of Tower 2. And she held up a well-worn picture of a very handsome young man in a soccer uniform. And he said, I'd smile weakly and reply that I'd keep looking for him. And he said, you know, there was nothing I could do. I, I didn't think we'd probably ever find him, but I had to keep telling her the same thing each night, we'll keep looking. And later in the evening, as first responders started to make their way home from the pile, many would stop and change out of their uniforms and shower before actually going home, watching the water run black with soot and debris, letting it wash away the physical evidence of the day. And many responders remember that day going home and placing their uniform and their boots, maybe their helmets in a bag, and leaving them in the garage or basement of their home, unable to wash them, but never unable to actually throw them away either. And for many responders, these uniforms remain stored away, even now, 16 years after the attacks. And when I was interviewing many of these responders, they actually showed me their uniform and the smell, I must say, even all these years down the track would permeate through the plastic bag. And I can imagine why they can't forget that smell. And so the toll from the search and rescue is evident. It's Wednesday morning, just 24 hours after the terrorist attacks of 9-11. And stunned and angry, the rest of the world watched on as the drama on, unfolded live on television. I was here in Melbourne, Australia, working for Ambulance Victoria, and I was watching it on a screen at our Triple O Emergency Communication Centre. And I know something deep down in me just realised that the whole world had changed. And among these people who were witnessing what was happening were the several hundred response crews um, particularly the emergency responders who were all queuing up around the perimeter of the pile trying to get in to help with the search and rescue activities. Among them were several hundred emergency medical service crews and ambulances who were staged along the West River Drive waiting their turn to work at the scene. And at that outer perimeter, the convoy of emergency personnel slowly made their way into Ground Zero, or a place that first responders were now referring to as the pile. On board one of these ambulances, a medic recalls that there was a trauma doctor sitting with them and he described the types of injuries that he expected them all to encounter that day. Though they didn't know it yet, sadly, there will be no injuries at all for them to treat. Hundreds of emergency vehicles litter the surrounding streets of the World Trade Centre site. They're mostly charred, crushed skeletons of vehicles. An abandoned FDNY engine whose crew is among the missing continues to pump water from the nearby Hudson River. And as the days turn into weeks, hundreds of first responders spend 12 hour shifts on the pile. As they approach the scene, there is debris everywhere, as far as they can see. Sidewalks are covered with concrete and steel, evidence that this was once the site of a thriving business precinct. And the toll from that search and rescue is evident. They talk about the smell again, the noise, the scene, what they saw. And one male paramedic tells me that it was horrible, the smells and what we had to do. I remember the first day, we were finding whole bodies. Then as the days went on, the stench started to tell us where to look. Soon, we were only finding pieces. Every day we'd be down there digging and if we found a bone, well, that was a good day. 16 years after 9-11, the first responders remain haunted by quirks of fate that day, and many have ongoing issues with survivor guilt. One paramedic told me that he remembered seeing his colleague, and he said, I remember seeing him, and we just hugged, and he told me to be careful, and he ran off in one direction, and I went in the other direction, and I never saw him again. And he tells me, if I had have just run with him, I would have died as well. And many of the responders who survived 9-11 particularly in those early years when I first started talking to these guys, were telling me that they didn't feel worthy of seeking care. Um, the fact that they'd survived, they told me, should have been enough, that they shouldn't have any extra help or assistance, that they were the lucky ones, that they were still here. But there are certain historical events that take place in a person's lifetime that leave a permanent imprint on them. And 9-11 was certainly that kind of event for many of the responders. The deaths of their colleagues and friends were so violent and so unexpected that they left the responders stunned and overwhelmed by this cumulative and ongoing grief 
and it's not surprising that many to this day suffer residual psychological effects from their ordeal and most of them live with ongoing survivor's guilt. They reflect on their gratefulness for being alive and how they strive to make the best of their second chance. But these feelings of guilt are persistent and when I've gone back at the five year, 10 year and most recently the 15 year anniversaries to talk to these responders, these feelings of guilt are ongoing. And when I was talking to one of the male paramedics last year and he told me that he felt guilty and he paused and he didn't continue and I could see that he was getting a little bit emotional. So I asked him gently, why? Why do you feel guilty? And he told me because he didn't find anyone alive and he started crying and he felt like he hadn't done his job. And this grief manifests itself among these responders in three key ways. Firstly, there's the guilt that many of them feel about surviving while so many of their colleagues and thousands of civilians died. Secondly, there's this guilt about the things that they failed to do, like not going back into the towers to rescue someone because they were trying to save their own life. Those experiencing this type of guilt tend to replay the event over and over again in their minds, trying to figure out some way that they could have done things differently and potentially have come up with a better outcome. And thirdly, there's the type of guilt about what they did do, such as leaving people behind or scrambling over others to escape. Some recall standing on body limbs or leaving people they knew behind or running ahead and not worrying about who was left behind, just trying to get out alive themselves. And when I talk to psychologists, they tell me that those experiencing this type of guilt are less likely to want to think about the events or reflect or talk about them. Um, and they don't go into their experiences at ground zero in as much detail. In addition to these feelings of guilt, it's probably not surprising that all of the first responders that I've spoken to over the years continue to be plagued by nightmares, vivid recollections of ground zero, anxiety, depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. And one male EMT that I was speaking to um, told me that it's been quite a long time but that last night he'd woken up again drenched with sweat and shaking because he'd been dreaming about being buried in the rubble. And he told me it seemed so real, my heart was pounding out of my chest. And he said the reason I woke up was because my dog was licking my face. He said he must have sensed that I was having some kind of a problem. And in addition to the psychosocial and mental health toll that 9-11 has had on the responders, it's also had a devastating physical impact. When those World Trade Centre Twin Towers collapsed on 9-11, they converted much of the tower's structure and contents into dense dust clouds of particles that settled on the streets and within buildings right throughout Lower Manhattan. About 90% of the settled World Trade Centre dust was a highly alkaline mixture of over two and a half thousand different toxins that was readily resuspendable by physical disturbance, such as search and rescue or walking through it, and low velocity air currents. High concentrations of this very toxic World Trade Center dust were inhaled and deposited in the conductive airways in the head and lungs, and subsequently swallowed, which caused both physical and chemical irritation to the respiratory and gastroesophageal epithelial of the thousands of emergency and non-emergency responders and to tens of thousands of people that were residing and working in downtown Manhattan at the time. And we now know that exposure to this kind of dust caused both acute and chronic adverse health effects, especially in those that were lacking effective personal respiratory protective equipment, which turns out was a large majority of the people working on the pile. World Trade Centre related health effects have been reported in a large number of research studies over the years. And these highlight an increased incidence of health effects in both the respiratory and the gastroesophageal tracts. They look at low birth weight and birth defects in children that were exposed in utero, post-traumatic stress disorders, as well as a growing concern about excess cancer incidents that may become further evident in future years. And we're certainly seeing the beginnings of that now. As I mentioned before, over a thousand responders are currently enrolled in the World Trade Centre Health Registry with cancers that are directly related to their exposure to 9-11 and hundreds have already died. <laughs> 
paramedics that were involved in Australian research that we um, did with Australian based researchers who came over to New York to actually talk um, to the responders about their ongoing physical and mental health issues following 9-11, identified a number of physical health impacts that are quite similar to those that have been reported in the international literature as well. All of the medics that we spoke to, the paramedics and EMTs, um, reported persistent respiratory and breathing problems. And 82% of our 54 paramedics and EMTs also told us that they had new allergies and that the onset of those allergies was quite soon after being exposed to the pile and breathing in that toxic dust. The paramedics and EMTs in our research also reported long-term health effects with their gastroesophageal tract. That was about a quarter of them had problems with that. And just over 40% had ongoing issues with their eyes. And all of the medics that we interviewed in 2016 identified that they were taking new medications that were directly related to illnesses associated with their exposure to 9-11 and the pile. And what's interesting is that just over half of these people actually reported that they were taking more than five new medications per day directly related to 9-11 related physical and mental health issues. And the kinds of illnesses that they most frequently reported to us were things like sinusitis, asthma and sleep apnea. But increasingly medics right across the, the cohort, um, plus firefighters, police and other responders all have growing concerns about getting cancer. As of June 30th last year, the Centers for Disease Control World Trade Center Health Program had enrolled more than 5,400 people who had been diagnosed with cancers directly linked to the 9-11 attacks. That's triple the number of people who had been enrolled with cancer diagnosis since January 2014. So when cancer rates for emergency first responders, so that's firefighters, police, paramedics and EMTs, when they're compared to the general United States population, cancer rates vary between 10 to 15% higher for these cohorts among those cohorts that were actually working at the at World Trade Center site. And new research confirms that this toxic cocktail that they breathed in is causing heightened rates of cancer amongst the first responders. Some first responders are also starting to show signs of cognitive impairment. So cognitive impairment records, uh, refers to poor memory and concentration and an inability to learn new information. And many people who are living with this kind of cognitive impairment may have difficulty performing the routine activities of daily life. And among the 54 paramedics and EMTs that we interviewed here through the Australian research, around a quarter of them had reported, and that, that's self-report, we didn't look at any medical records or follow up with any doctors, but about a quarter of them actually reported that they were having some kind of cognitive difficulty. And research from a study from the Stony Brook World Trade Center Wellness Program has identified that the average age of first responders with cognitive impairment is only 53. Now that's quite young. And the Stony Brook team found that impairment was most evident amongst responders who also suffered PTSD. In addition to this, the physical impact and the mental health impact, is also this impact that we're witnessing on the marriage and the family cohesiveness of the first responders. And this is certainly something that is um, becoming more evident as the years uh, move on. So we know that marriages and family cohesiveness have been significantly strained and sometimes broken in the aftermath of 9-11. While there's no official record, anecdotal reports suggest the divorce rate amongst the 9-11 responders is high. And I have a little personal story that um, I've been given permission to, to um, relay to you all. And it was on the evening of the 10th of September 2002, so just under a year to the day of the 9-11 attacks, when, when a firefighter, FDNY firefighter, um, sat down with his wife in their home and told her that their marriage of 19 years was over. At least that's how she remembers it when she recalls it to me. She said it was the night before their one year anniversary of 9-11 and that her husband told her that he hadn't been happy in their marriage for quite some time. She tells me that she knew things had been tough since he'd been involved in the response to 9-11 and they'd lost so many of his colleagues and friends. But she said she hadn't realised it had come to this, to the point of ending a marriage. However, over time it became increasingly clear to her that the reason her husband had left 
wasn't so much about him being unhappy in their marriage, but more about him being happier with another woman. A few months earlier, it turns out, he'd met and become involved with a widow of one of his fallen colleagues. And like the, the um, wife that I was talking to, this widow was an attractive woman in her early 40s, a stay-at-home mother to four children who had hardly worked outside the home since the day she married her firefighter husband. And although today if you spoke to both of these women, they'd very much deny that they had anything in common, their lives had actually followed very similar paths until the 11th of September 2001, when one husband, when one husband came home from work and one husband did not. One woman's life never recovered from that day, although no one would have predicted that it was the life of the woman whose husband was actually spared. And as unlikely though her story seems, this woman that I spoke to is not the only wife of a firefighter whose husband has left her for a 9-11 widow. Anecdotal reports highlight that around 13 firefighters and at least one EMT that we know of have divorced their wives and remarried the widows of their fallen colleagues. And this makes it incredibly difficult for these family members to, to deal with their own psychosocial uh, impact from 9-11. From so they've been trying to, to support their loved ones through this ordeal and then in the end they get left alone and have to deal with, with the divorce and the separation and everything that comes with that. And many of the spouses that I spoke to over the years have, have told me how they felt left out of the support loop. They were neglected by their spouses who were very busy caring for the widows of their fallen colleagues but they felt like who was actually looking after them. Firefighter Rudy Sanfilippo knows firsthand the toll that the pile can take on the families of responders. In a report online, he said that you work and work and the best thing you can do is call a widow to say, we found the tip of your husband's pinky. We lost control at the site and we lost control at home. In both places, we were doing the best we could, but it wasn't sufficient. Before this, we'd been good providers. And around 18 months after 9-11, San Filippo sat down for a family dinner with all of his adult children. And he recalled to the interviewer that as they all sat down, one of them said to him, well, you know, welcome home, because it had been so long since he'd actually sat down with his own family, because he'd been so uh, focused on helping everybody else and dedicating his time to the search and recovery efforts at the scene that to a large extent he'd actually neglected his own family. And in the wake of the overwhelming number of losses of 9-11, a job that should have usually fallen to a designated senior member of the FDNY became the job of all the men in the New York firehouses. So they were actually tasked with checking up on the widows of their fallen colleagues and they were asked to help them do the paperwork and ensure that they attended all of the relevant meetings with the 9-11 families and receive all of the support that they were entitled to. But the problem was that helping these widows through this incredibly stressful time meant that a lot of these firefighters formed very close bonds with some of these widows. And in turn, some of these widows became very dependent on the, the, um, the relationship that they were building with these firefighters. And the firefighters themselves weren't prepared for this and they weren't prepared for the emotional toll that came with helping the widows through this incredibly traumatic time. So it's not surprising, therefore, that many of them actually ended up forming these, these bonds and, and many of them still have these relationships in place all these years down the track. And so as I mentioned, in many of these firehouses, it was the individual firefighter that was assigned as a liaison for the widow. And many of them, as I said, were very unprepared for the emotional burden that came with this role. And of course, you need to remember that at that time, they were also attending tens, if not twenties, of you know, wakes and funerals at the same time. And many of these were young men who were single and didn't really have support structures in place around them to actually help them deal with the fallout that came with, with taking on these roles. Um, and as I mentioned, in, in some cases, the widows actually fell in love with their designated liaisons and these happily married men then had to try and find a delicate way to extricate themselves from the situation without exacerbating the distress that these widows were already experiencing. And then most recently at the 15 year milestone, I was actually invited by a number of the families to actually talk to the wives and the children of the responders. 
Um, and it was very interesting to get the perspectives from some of these children. And this particular account came through of, of um, one child who was actually a, a brother. So there was a brother and sister that we interviewed from the same paramedic father. And it was very interesting to see the different perspectives of the different children who, who went through the same situation. And so this child told me that, you know, it's hard, you know, my dad and I don't have the greatest relationship. And I don't know if that's just because of 9-11 or if it would have been that way anyway. But as a kid, it was definitely tough. Everyone in our community thought that dad was a hero. But to me, he was a coward. He never spent any time with us. He preferred to be with all of the 9-11 families. He forgot that we were a 9-11 family, his own flesh and blood. But it seemed more important to him to spend time with the widows and other kids. Then when he did come home, he was a mean drunk. I mean, I pushed his buttons, I admit it. He hit me a few times until I started hitting back. But I'd rather he take it out on me than mum or Kate. But I've never forgiven him. We still really don't talk too much. It's sad to admit it, but at times I actually wished he'd died that day. And then we've got the added burden of insurance and compensation that's particularly problematic for the first responders. Former emergency medical technician Sal Taturici wasn't in Lower Manhattan on the day the planes hit, but he worked for four months after 9-11 operating machinery that transported body parts from ground zero to a makeshift morgue. In, to in 2016, Sal was diagnosed with terminal liver cancer that was directly related to his time at the Ground Zero site. Under the 2005 World Trade Centre Disability Law, responders who became disabled as a result of 9-11 related operations are entitled to a 75% disability pension. But the deadline to submit that form was the 11th of September 2015. Sal got sick on the 4th of October that year. When I spoke to his wife, Wendy, and she said he only missed it by three weeks. The only reason he wasn't eligible for his disability pension wasn't because he wasn't sick enough, but because he didn't fill out the paperwork in time. It's just the most ridiculous thing. And unfortunately, Sal's not alone. Uh, many of the other responders who uh, spent time on the pile have suffered similar issues and um, have been chasing up insurance. And it's just a, an issue that they shouldn't have to be, be dealing with. So now as we start to move forward to, towards getting close to the end of the, the webinar, I'd like to also touch on the other responders, sometimes those that, that often get forgotten in our discussions. And for most people, the story of 9-11 ends with the collapse of the towers. The recovery operation that lasted for eight months is generally nothing more than a few scenes of footage tacked onto the end of 9-11 media that usually surfaces around each anniversary. But if you watch any of the footage of the aftermath at Ground Zero, you'll no doubt see thousands of people climbing on top of the pile, carefully looking for victims, while also clearing the immense pile of smouldering debris that was all that remained of those famous Twin Towers. Have you ever wondered who all those people were? New York City didn't have enough emergency rescue personnel to continually man the 12-hour search shifts. No city does. So who were they? The answer is they were regular people. They were iron workers, engineers, heavy equipment operators and construction workers who were tasked with the very tangible, physical work of cleaning up the World Trade Center wreckage. Most of them volunteered from all over the United States, spending lengthy periods of time away from their families to work on top of the mountain of still burning rubble, breathing in that toxic smoke for days and weeks in hopes of doing some good. John Field, who was a foreman with a private demolition company, was working on a job site about an hour upstate of New York City when his crew first got the news that a plane had struck the North Tower. After reports came in minutes later that the South Tower had also been hit, John gave the order to his men on site to go home. He, however, packed up and headed straight into New York City with whoever wanted to come along with him. They were motivated by the thought of people being buried and trapped under the rubble, and they knew that they could help to get them out. When John arrived at Ground Zero, he realised that he was one of hundreds, if not thousands of volunteers who had already self-deployed to the World Trade Centre site. Most had no clear idea about what they were going to contribute to the overwhelming task at hand, but many, like John, had come to help with the demolition, demolition and excavation that was going to be needed. 
and the immediate goal was finding any survivors under that 1.8 million tonnes of steel, concrete and plaster. And in those early hours, everyone at the site was convinced that they would find survivors. Surely there were voids within the rubble where people were waiting to be rescued. There had to be people who had survived the collapse of the buildings, they all thought. Within those first 48 hours at Ground Zero, the thousands of emergency first responders joined forces with tens of thousands of non-emergency responders like John to try to find those buried below. But below that pile, subterranean fires were continued to burn for around 100 days, making it a very hostile pile of heat, acrid smoke and anguish. And no one turned the volunteers away. The need for sheer numbers was so immediate and dire. But as the days wore on and with hope of finding anyone else alive beginning to fade, that initial search and rescue changed to debris removal and remains management. And the bucket brigades of emergency and non-emergency responders working together could be seen on the surface of the pile, like lines of ants. But it was a dangerous landscape for these people to be working on. Aside from the long-term danger of breathing in that same toxic dust that the emergency responders were breathing in, they were also working on that um, very smouldering and moving pile. The whole time they were at risk and they knew that there was, the ground could give way between them at any moment. Each step came with the knowledge that they could be plunged into the darkness and the fiery hell below ground zero. But still they came, still they worked, and all of them um, continue to have those same sort of physical and mental health impacts as the emergency responders who seem to be the focus of, of much of the research that's come out following 9-11. And finally, um, the, the last group of responders that I'd like to, to focus on are what I sort of term the forgotten first responders. So on that morning of 9-11, few felt the pressure of what was unfolding more than the 911 dispatchers into whose headsets poured the thousands of cries for help that day. The calls came in without pause, more than 3,000 of them in the first 10 minutes, constant pleas for help. Throughout that day, more than 55,000 calls would come in across the city. And these people had to make incredibly difficult decisions. Did they stay on the line with someone who was no longer responding to them? How long did they stay on the phone with someone, even though they knew some of these people were dying while they were talking to them, when they knew that thousands of other people were trying to call through? The day was so traumatic that many of them would never return to work. In the 102 minutes between the time that the first plane struck the North Tower and when the tower fell, the demeanour of the 911 dispatchers can be heard to evolve on the 9-11 calls that have been released by the city. Initially, many of them answered with brisk professionalism, the way they're taught. Some of them maybe even sounded a little bit gruff. They were efficient to the point of being abrupt. I've got to answer more calls, a fire dispatcher told a distressed man. Can you speed it up? But the responses start to become more empathetic as the prospects for rescue become more remote. Okay. Dispatchers started to spend more time on each call. We're on the way, we're on the way. I'm here with you, says 1911 dispatcher. And many years after 9-11, five fire department dispatcher John still lives with those voices that he heard that morning. And when I talked to him, he told me, sometimes at night, you know, you hear stuff, you hear voices calling for help. And so many of the dispatchers that I spoke to have those same recollections that they can remember voices, they remember things that were told to them. Many of these people were the last person on the phone with these people before they died. So how do you cope with that? How do you deal with that when you certainly haven't been trained for it? Overworked, overwhelmed, these dispatchers were thrust into situations for which no training could possibly prepare them. Yet they kept picking up the phones, improvising answers even when they were exasperated, even when they were in the dark about evacuation orders that had actually been issued by fire and police commanders at the scene. Helplessness increasingly defined their predicament and it showed in some of their conversations when they're trying to tell people what to do but you can just hear them, they, they don't know what to say anymore. I wish I knew what to tell you, I'm so sorry, says one 911 dispatcher to a caller. And recordings of these 911 dispatchers trying to calm the thousands of distressed callers are very difficult to listen to. On some, 
the dispatcher is on the line with someone when the t in the towers when they die. Some die slowly from probable smoke inhalation, their response becoming slower until there are no more words and just empty air at the end of the line. But on other calls, you can hear the fear in people's voices and then you can hear that audible rumble as the tower starts to collapse and the call drops out. But the calls from civilians just kept coming, as did the radio transmissions from the emergency units at the scene. Brief silences for the dispatchers were broken by frantic calls, but perhaps some of the most difficult were the ones that crackled in after the towers had fallen, ones that many of us never knew had come through. Mayday, mayday, one of the towers has collapsed. Mayday, I'm trapped in the rubble. Many of these calls were from firefighters who had survived the initial collapse of the tower, but were never found in time. And just as we're approaching the, the final time for our webinar to wrap up so we can have some Q&A time, um, when I finish my interviews with these responders, I always ask them, what's the, what's the one thing you'd like people to know? If I can be your voice and tell people your story, what's the one thing you want people to hear? And overwhelmingly, it's that they're worried that this new generation of people coming through think of 9-11 as something that happened in the past. But for responders, it still feels like yesterday. They're still living with the impact now. They feel tired. They feel overwhelmed. They feel like their support systems are fatigued. They say they want to move on. They know they want the people around them want them to move on. But they tell me, how can I? How can I move on when I'm still either physically sick or they still have the mental health problems or they're watching their friends and colleagues continue to die in ever, ever increasing numbers due to that day? So how on earth are they, can they be expected to actually move on? So I think it's fitting to end this presentation with one final message, one collective voice from the responders that have been involved in my research over the years, and that's don't forget about us. And just to final, um, one final uh, thought is that I've actually written a, an e-book that's freely available and it's actually a, a much more expansive um, documentation of the kind of um, issues that I've touched on this morning. It's called After the Towers Fell, 9-11 First Responders and Their Families Share Their Story. You can download it via Apple iBook for free or if you'd like me to email your copy, a PDF version, um, you can send me an email to the email on your screen and I'll happily send you through a PDF version. And I'm also happy to share a PDF copy of, of the slide notes if anyone would like those as well. So with that, I thank you very much for your time. I hope it's um, been an informative presentation. And I flip back to Andrew to see if there are any questions from the um, people who have signed in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erin. That was really well done and very insightful. And personally, I really had not thought much about the uh, groups of individuals you refer to as the other responders or the individuals who participated in the cleanup and the search and rescue days and weeks after 9-11. Uh, so that really added a perspective that I've really not thought about much before. So thank you for that. Um, if there are any questions, um, please go ahead and click on the hand icon. Um, that will um, basically indicate to me that you're raising your hand and then we can unmute your microphone and you can ask a question. Um, don't see anyone with questions yet, but don't don't be shy here. Okay, I have one with uh, Rowena Christensen. Uh, Rowena, I'm going to go ahead and and unmute your microphone. Go ahead, Rowena. Uh, good morning, Erin. A wonderful Hi, person. Rowena. How are you? I'm, I'm well and thank you so much for your um, your presentation. It was incredibly in, insightful and um, very, very profound and it sort of brings back the memories of, of looking at the pictures of what was happening. And I remember the most poignant thing was uh, seeing a, a little dusty teddy bear sitting on, on the rubble and that, that um, just sort of some summed it all up that that it was so many different people whose lives were just um, tragically taken away that day and knowing about the ongoing in impact um, I think you've done a wonderful job with the research so just to get to my question sorry um, you mentioned that a couple of times that there was very 
little that actually ended up coming into the, the emergency rooms by way of trauma or injuries and um, and I just wondered if you had any more information about that or um, whether whether as a result of people who came in that there was any noticeable ongoing impact on the, the people working in the EDs as well. Uh, thank you. Thanks Rowena. Um, I don't have a lot of information unfortunately on what happened um, at the hospital level. All of my research is certainly focused on um, that pre-hospital environment. But from some of the anecdotal reports that I've heard from responders that I have been working with and some of the people that I have spoken to who were at the hospitals, um, certainly there is some of that ongoing impact. Um, probably not as severe as, as the first responders and the other responders who were actually associated with that direct immediate response. Um, certainly not the same physical impact because they weren't necessarily at the scene breathing in the same toxic dust that um, the responders and, and the other responders at the scene were, but certainly mental health issues just associated with, I mean there certainly were presentations, there, there were I believe 20 odd people pulled from the rubble um, and most of those needed surgery and I know there were certainly um, hundreds of presentations at hospitals for, for, for fairly minor injuries um, and there certainly were in those first hours quite a few significant burns injuries, um, particularly in the North Tower when the first plane hit and this um, jet fuel rushed down the elevator shaft and burn, uh, burst into the lobby of the North Tower and quite a few people uh, sustained very traumatic burn injuries um, when they were actually standing in that lobby area when the fireball exploded from the elevator shaft. So I know I certainly spoke to the paramedics that transported uh, or saw and treated that, that, um, those patients. They said it was terribly distressing to witness that. So I'm sure people who were involved in that ongoing care um, at the ED and then obviously further into the hospital in surgery and, and burns units and, and so forth would have had that same kind of psychosocial impact to some level. Um, but in terms of numbers and things like that, um, I don't unfortunately have that information available. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we do have uh, at least one other question I see here from Dr. Bob. Ditch. So, uh, Dr. Ditch, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone if you'd like to ask a question. Go yes, ahead. Can you, hear me? can you hear me okay? Yep. I can hear you, Bob. Yeah, the question I've got is I was a, um, a Department of Defense, uh, I was a military officer that was sent to Ground Zero that evening, and I was the DOD liaison. Uh, background is also a firefighter, uh, and so I spent time basically providing liaison for the Department of Defense, but also when I had free time, which was kind of like impossible to have, but I helped out on the pile. Over the years, I was, I was diagnosed with um, a chronic uh, non-infectious bronchitis, acute um, cough, a little um, raspiness and hoarseness. And because I teach quite a bit, it's become more acute over the years. This past um, uh, May, uh, I went through my third evolution of CAT scans of uh, my lungs to uh, keep up because I was a World Trade Center uh, uh, enrollee. And this year, completely by accident, and I'm just completely by accident, a very, very poor uh, scan revealed something on the edge of the film, which uh, the radiologist required me to go back and get an, an abdominal scan. And they found that I had a growth on my kidney, which turned out to be a kidney cancer. Uh, that was clearly attributable to the toxins that were being filtered out and I had to have surgery. As I did more research onto this, I found that a significant number of World Trade Center cancer victims suffering from the same clear cell carcinoma cancers. And the, and the question that I had is, is there anything that is going on to alert first responders who were exposed to these chemicals to possibly have scans done because in my case it was done, it, I discovered it completely by accident before it became a real um, mortal type of circumstance. In fact, I fell within I guess this one percentile group of individuals that find out by accident and they're able to remove, in my case it was a golf ball sized clear cell carcinoma from the kidney and although it left a really large uh, scar across my stomach, uh, it's basically done. They were able to remove all the cancer. Um, 
and the borders were clear. My concern is if I'm one out of many who have gotten it, is there a mechanism to alert others to have follow-up scans to look to see if in fact they are also um, victims of kidney cancer and they don't know it. In most cases you won't find out until these growths are the size of a baseball, you have blood in your urine and it's probably metastasized and it's too late. Well, firstly, Bob, thank you for sharing that, and I'm terribly sorry to hear that you've, you've had to go through that, and I hope you're doing okay now. Um, I can only comment on the responders that have been involved in, in my research over the years, and I believe they all have very similar stories to what you've just shared, in that most of them um, who found their cancers found them almost by accident, that they were being treated for something else or had presented for, for something else, and... Um, you know, found out that they had cancer that they weren't expecting somewhere else. Um, from what I can gather um, from some of the support groups that I'm um, involved with, uh, it's largely up to the individual responders. I don't believe that there are routine reminders sent out to say, hey, get checked this, check for this, check for that. I know John Field, through his Feel Good Foundation, sends out a lot of information um, to people who sign up and join his um, membership. Um, whether that happens through other support groups as well. Um, but I'm not aware of any, um, you know, formal kind of notification process um, that occurs. I totally agree. I think it should. It probably should be something that comes from the World Trade Centre Health Registry um, to alert people as to what kinds of cancers have been identified and, and what you should be looking for and what you should be getting checked for. I, I'm not sure if that happens or if it does, how routinely it happens. But I totally support the idea that with the incidence of cancer increasing so astronomically that this is going to have to be something that they address. Thank you, Erin. Um, we have a couple questions that have come in uh, through the chat uh, or the question pane or the question panel. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read a few of these before we wrap things up. Uh, the first question is, has there been any evidence demonstrating differences or similarities similarities between first responders in human-made disasters like 9-11 and natural disasters? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I th it's interesting because I think the, the human-made uh, disasters such as a terrorist event have such unique um, aspects that I think make them quite different to a natural disaster. Previous research that I've actually done just with our emergency responders here in Australia actually looked at risk perceptions for a whole range of different disaster types. And it turns out that anything with some kind of uncontrollable nature, um, some kind of invisibility where you can't actually physically see the threat that you're dealing with, so you can't see a terrorism threat before it happens, whereas you can see a bushfire, for example, or you can see a flood. Um, and things that people have more familiarity with compared to unfamiliarity, that with all of these issues, the, the risk perception increases. And as the risk perception increases, um, the, the whole host of things that get impacted by that. Um, in terms of the impacts, I think the impacts, there will be some that will be similar, like some of this um, mental health stuff will certainly be similar. And I'm sure there are um, cases of anxiety and PTSD and um, things like that that occur following ma um, both man-made and natural disasters. But I think the man-made stuff, particularly the terrorism, um, has the stuff that we can't really predict. And I think that's where we have that ongoing, um, you know, stuff that we can't probably prepare for or deal with as, as well. Um, and it's just the unique aspects of the type of man-made disaster. So, for example, with the World Trade Centre, nobody would have guessed that those towers would come down and cause um, a toxic dust to hang around lower Manhattan for, for months on end and that it was made up of over two and a half thousand different toxins. Um, if the, that toxic dust hadn't have been there, we probably wouldn't be dealing with the same kind of physical impact that we're dealing with today. Um, so I, I guess it's a long-winded way of saying yes and no. Um, there's certainly going to be similarities, particularly with the mental health impact, but I think there'll certainly be differences depending on the type of event um, that responders are, are witness to. Great, thank you for that. And I guess we have time for one last question here. Um, I guess it's a bit more directed to you personally, but it, it, the, the question is, how do you take care of yourself when you are researching such sad material? 
Well, that's a very interesting and very thoughtful question and whoever asked that, I, I thank you for asking. Um, and the truth is I probably didn't realise the personal toll until quite recently where I actually thought I was having a little bit of anxiety and panic attacks. And when I actually sat down and addressed it with um, the help of a mental health practitioner, and she actually, you know, opened up this whole field of vicarious or secondary trauma to me. And she said, you can't not take on board some of the emotion when you're listening to these stories. And she said, when they traditionally looked at vicarious trauma, it was when psychologists and psychiatrists were listening to traumatic stories being told by their patients. And when that happens cumulatively over time, it's very difficult to not take on board some of that emotion. And so when I've been dealing with um, these responders um, over a 15-year period, and it's very difficult to not cross that line between professional and personal, I've become very close with a lot of these people and their families. So of course, it becomes incredibly distressing when you do see them become physically ill. Um, sadly, we had our first death among the cohort of responders that I've been following, and 14 others currently have cancer diagnoses. So it certainly had a personal impact on me. And that personal toll has also then impacted my husband because he'll come home and see me on the couch in my pyjamas crying. And he's like, oh, you've been doing your 9-11 work again. Um, so I've learned that I have to put in place some protective boundaries around what I do um, and just always be cognizant of what the goal was when I set out with this, with this research to begin with. And that was to tell the stories. So it's been very important for me to remember I'm not a mental health practitioner. I can't help these people in that regard, but the way I can help is by telling their story and continuing to share their impact. And so learning that and putting that protective boundary around myself has, has been very important. Um, so I thank you for that question. Great. Um, thank you for um, answering that. It's a, a very interesting experience that you've had while conducting this research and I would imagine it would be difficult not to take and internalize some of this uh, as you've been doing this over the last 15 uh, years. Um, we, we don't have any other questions at this point and I think we're over the hour limit so it's probably a good opportunity to, for us to wrap this up. We will post uh, the recording of this and if, if Aaron, if you're willing, we could put the slides up as well on the Wadham website um, within the next day or two and, and I'll send an email out to the uh, webinar registration list so that everyone knows that those are available and those who unfortunately weren't able to participate they'll be notified so they can uh, view the presentation as well and the slides. That's great, thank you Andrew and thank you for everyone who took time out of their schedule to listen in today. And thank you everyone. Um, I'll just echo what Aaron said. I, I know some of you, you're up very early or it might be quite late at night and we appreciate you participating uh, in our webinar series and we'll be sending out some information. We have at least one more, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, scheduled uh, for next month and we'll be uh, posting information about that in the coming days. Thank you, everybody.